In this case, I'd like to share with you a very interesting scenario. This patient was operated elsewhere four days ago and the surgery was abandoned. The surgeon had come to the point of partially completing the capsular rexis, after which, because of limited visibility, as the pupil came down, the surgeon abandoned the case. Now, when you are faced with a patient like this, there are various considerations. One, these eyes are sensitive. They should always be operated under a peribulbar block. And second, since you're not the primary surgeon, you really don't know what you're going to find in there. It's very important to take a guarded visual prognosis consent and if possible, even keep a vitroretinal standby at hand. And therefore, perhaps it's also important to keep at hand a suitably calculated three-piece IOL as well as a scleral fixated IOL should the need arise. Let's now move to the surgery itself. At the outset, you need to define where were the side port incisions that were taken by the primary surgeon. Since there was no 2.8 incision created, I first go ahead and create a 2.8 incision at a point that suits me. I take adequate time to stain the anterior capsule because I need to be able to see it clearly. After suitably staining the anterior capsule, I'm able to ascertain what exactly is the status of the anterior capsule. I can see the partial capsular rexus and I can see the point at which the capsular tear has extended deep to the pupillary edge and I do not know where exactly it lies. At this point, I'm unaware about whether the tear in the anterior capsule has extended all the way up to the equator or up to the zonules or is still salvageable. So one attempts to salvage the rexes. The first thing I need to do is enlarge the incision to allow for the intraocular forceps to comfortably go in. And now, taking the help of this intraocular forceps, which is now introduced from the side opposite to the tear in the rexes, I try and get a hold of the edge of the capsule and attempt to enlarge this rexes. This first attempt seems unsuccessful because I'm unable to enlarge this tear. With the first attempt, I find a significant amount of resistance. I try and now grasp the edge of the capsule slightly closer and once having held it, without letting go, I firmly pull on the capsule and I can feel the tear actually happening. I'm able to turn the tear around and create a capsular excess. It's quite possible that it's gone pretty much out up to the equator and got back in, but it doesn't matter. It's still going to remain a stable capsular bag. I'd also like you to notice the tendency to iris prolapse from these rather large sideboard incisions. With the help of a little viscoelastic, the iris is repositioned after which the intraocular forceps is introduced now from the left side and the capsular rexis is completed. As you will notice, you've ended up with a fairly eccentric rexis and a capsular rexis like this could result in the nucleus tending to pop out superiorly because of how far out it is there and the eminent danger to the inferior rexis edge with the phaco probe or the chopper because it is much smaller and seems to be quite close to the center. Now, since the capsule is only visible on the right side, I perform a capsular rexis at the 9 o'clock position, look for the nucleus rise and confirm the rotation of the nucleus. Now, having completed the hydrodissection, I move now to the nucleus emulsification. I plan to perform the direct chop technique. The settings that I'm going to work with is about 40% phaco power, a vacuum of 300 millimeters mercury and a flow rate of about 35 to 40 cc per minute. At all points I need to be vigilant and I need to be careful and ensure I do not damage the inferior excess edge. Because the side port was created in the previous surgery and it was little larger than what I would use, there seems to be an obvious tendency to iris prolapse. Continuing to work through the same side port would cause a constant prolapse of iris. So I therefore choose to hydrate this side port and now I create a new side port incision and then proceed using this newly created side port incision for the second instrument for the rest of the nucleus management. We now proceed with the direct chop procedure. I'd like you to note how 
the fairly centrally placed inferior rexes causes a significant challenge to the nucleus disassembly. So in hindsight, I think it would have been better to enlarge the rexes prior to the nucleus management itself. As you can see, the nucleus is suitably downsized and emulsified. Following the completion of the nucleus emulsification, we then proceed with the irrigation aspiration. You will notice the iris prolapsing through the left side port incision. The reason why this is happening is because the incision which was created was much larger than was actually required for any step of phaco emulsification. So what does one do at this point? Perhaps it would be in the best interest to stop the surgery, reposit the iris, and then you could do one of either two things. Either you hydrate the sideboard, watch for stability of the wound, or you take a suture and then create a new sideboard and complete the irrigation aspiration using this newly created sideboard incision. Now let's see how I manage this case. I use the iris repositor to gradually nudge the iris back into the eye. Very often what I would do is actually pull the iris in from the opposite sideboard. I often find that a simpler procedure. And having created a new paracentesis incision, which is more suitably sized, I now proceed to completing the irrigation aspiration. At the end of irrigation aspiration, the anterior chamber is refilled and the capsular bag insufflated with viscoelastic and this is followed by the insertion of the single piece monofocal IOL within the capsular bag. This is followed by the removal of all the excessive viscoelastic from the anterior chamber and around the lens And finally, by a careful stromal hydration. So let's summarize. For a patient that has been operated partially in another center or in the same hospital, but is now being handed over to you on another day, we are looking at eyes which are sensitive and therefore I believe would be better off if blocked. This being a second surgery, you must always ensure that you have adequate endothelial protection. Use a good dispersive viscoelastic to achieve the same. You must also always ensure that you've got a very well stained anterior capsule. Now this is going to aid your visibility throughout the surgery. Sometimes you might actually find that the pupils do not dilate. In such cases, I think you should be encouraged to use pupillary dilating devices as and when required to make these rather challenging cases easier to manage. It's preferable to follow the technique that you are most comfortable with for the nucleus management. And finally, because of the unpredictability of what exactly is going on in the eye, keep all the possible lenses that you may require at hand. With this, I come to the end of the tutorial. Thank you.